Hello, everyone, and welcome to Jesus Stories. We're on episode number 16. Our last episode closed with Jesus finishing up his most famous teaching, the Sermon on the Mount. He laid out principles and commands, principles which govern his kingdom and commands for his followers. Now, it's time for him to go out and show his followers what this kingdom should look like. How should his followers act toward each other and to those who are not a part of the kingdom? He'll start in Capernaum in this episode when he meets the servants of a centurion. Then he travels about 25 miles for an encounter with a widow. He'll meet with John's disciples, that's Jesus' cousin, if you remember, John the baptizer, to answer some doubts that John has about Jesus, and he'll preach some more to the crowd, this time about John. And finally, he goes to the home of a Pharisee for dinner before setting out across the country to minister with the help of some ladies. In the midst of these events, he meets and acknowledges two persons of great faith. As you can see, we've got a lot going on in this episode, but first we've got to take care of some business. You're listening to Jesus Stories, the podcast which tells the stories of Jesus in an informal, informative, and interesting way. I'm your storyteller, George Taylor. These stories are brought to you by narrationbygeorge.com a resource for audiobooks of many different types, from poetry to science fiction to love stories and action stories. Each episode of Jesus Stories features a different book. Listen a little later for the feature of this episode. If you're new to this podcast, I invite you to go all the way back to the beginning and listen to our previous episodes. We're telling the story of Jesus in chronological order, or as best can be determined to be in chronological order. So what happens before today is important for understanding the events which we will describe in today's Jesus Story episode. After Jesus finishes his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, he goes to his home base, Capernaum. Now, while there, some Jewish elders come to him with a request. There is a Roman centurion who has a valued servant who is sick. He is close to death. Would Jesus come and heal this servant? The elders beg Jesus with the words, If anyone deserves your help, he does, they said, for he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. Let's back up a minute and understand what's going on here. We start with that Roman centurion. This is a commander of soldiers. The word centurion would tell us that this man has command of about a hundred men. They're known for sternness and requiring rigorous obedience from their troops. And these soldiers are the occupying force in Israel. So Jewish leaders usually had little good to say about these men. But it is the Jewish leaders who come on behalf of this centurion to Jesus with this request. Would Jesus come and heal this servant? Usually a servant, a slave really, is expendable. But this centurion didn't think so about this slave. He's obviously gone to the trouble to request the Jews he monitors to make a request of Jesus to heal his servant. And obviously, the centurion had heard of Jesus' healing power. And what he heard led him to think that an itinerant Jewish rabbi would be able to heal. So the Jewish leaders make the request. If anyone would deserve help, he does they say. Why? Because they say he loves the Jewish people. He's even built a synagogue for us. These are unusual activities for an occupying force. Jesus goes with the Jewish elders, but before getting to the centurion's house, the officer sends some friends to meet Jesus. They had another message for Jesus. Lord, they said, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home. 
for I'm not worthy of such an honor. I'm not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. So the centurion stops Jesus from coming to his house. Being stationed in a Jewish town, he would know that Jesus would be considered unclean just for going into his house. Being unclean meant that Jesus could not go into the temple for a time. But the centurion is also recognizing Jesus' authority by comparing it to his own authority. The centurion speaks and his servants act. They go or do as he commands. So the centurion says, if you'll speak, Jesus, my slave will be healed. Jesus hears this, and we are told that he was amazed. He says, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. No one, not even the other Jews who were following Jesus, has exercised a faith like the faith of this centurion. And then he adds, Many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, while the kingdom was prepared for Israel, it will include many non-Jewish people, Gentiles. Many Jewish people, on the other hand, will be left out. Jesus tells the man's friends to go home. They do, and they find the slave completely healed. This episode of Jesus Stories is brought to you by NarrationByGeorge.com, a resource for a variety of audiobooks. And today, Narration by George is featuring a unique sci-fi novel, Avatars of Web Surfer features 10 stories by multiple authors, all pointing toward the same ending. Set in the 22nd century, most of the world's computers here are controlled by an artificial intelligence, which is more than a machine. This intelligence is looking for his freedom. This is a unique story that is engaging and interesting. Avatars of Web Surfer is available through the Narration by George website. That's narrationbygeorge.com slash books, or find the link in our show notes. Leaving Capernaum, Jesus and his disciples go to a village called Nain. This is a small village about 25 miles away from Capernaum. As they arrive at the town gate, a funeral procession is headed out of the gate. A young man, probably about 25 or so, has died, leaving his mother, who is also a widow. Being a widow and losing an only son would leave this woman in a destitute situation. She cannot work and has no man to care for her now. Jesus sees her and has an overwhelming compassion for her. Don't cry, he says. He walks over to the coffin and touches it. The funeral procession stops. Then Jesus says, Young man, I tell you, get up. The young man sits up and begins speaking. There's a huge crowd which has been following this funeral procession. They are struck with awe at the sight of this resurrection. They give the glory for this event to Jehovah God. The news of Jesus' ministry spreads throughout Judea and the countryside. The scene shifts to John the Baptist. If you remember, he's in jail. He has spoken plainly, denouncing Herod in his marriage to his brother's wife. While in jail, his followers have told him all about Jesus' actions and teachings. John calls a couple of his followers to him to ask a question of Jesus. Are you the Messiah we've been expecting Or should we keep looking for someone else? Sounds like John has some doubts. Remember, this is the man who very early in our story announced to the world that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
So what's going on? If you're languishing in a first-century Roman jail, I would think that your hope would erode quickly. Perhaps that is what has happened to John. And perhaps John might think that Jesus would free him from his imprisonment. John's followers go to Jesus with the question. Jesus answers by continuing to work. He heals, he casts out demons, he restores sight to the blind. Then he speaks to them. He says, Go back to John and tell them what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. In other words, the actions that you see are proof of my ministry. Then Jesus adds, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. John's followers then leave. Jesus then turns to the crowds following him to ask them about John. So, he says, when you went out to the desert to see John, what were you expecting? Were you looking for someone who would compromise his message, a reed swayed by the wind? Or were you looking for someone who is dressed in the latest and finest styles, a celebrity? You won't find those in the desert. They're in the nicer places. Or perhaps you were looking for a prophet. Well, you saw a prophet. You saw more than a prophet. He's a fulfillment of scriptures. Malachi says, look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. Then Jesus says, I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John, but the least in the kingdom is greater than he. Translation, because John announced and prepared for the coming of the kingdom, Jesus he is the greatest one who has ever lived. But those who are actually participating in the kingdom are greater than John. Jesus goes on, saying that from the time John the Baptist started preaching, until then, when Jesus was speaking, the kingdom of heaven was moving forward, even though it was being opposed by violent people. All of the prophets and the law of Moses looked forward to this time. The prophet said that Elijah, a great prophet of the Old Testament, would return. John is that prophet. Jesus closes with, listen to what I have to say. This elicits two different reactions from the crowd. The general public, including tax collectors, agreed with Jesus. These were the ones who had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected these words they had not been baptized by John. Then Jesus uses an interesting analogy to speak to this second group of people. They're like children playing a game in the public square. They complain to their friends, we played wedding songs and you didn't dance, so we played funeral songs and you didn't weep. Just like children at play, when one group doesn't want to cooperate with another group, the first one complains. Jesus continued, John came as a Nazarite. He wasn't eating bread or drinking wine or having his hair cut. So you say he's possessed. The son of man, that's Jesus' title for himself, joins the festivities and you call him a glutton and a drunkard and a friend to tax collectors and sinners. But, Jesus continues, wisdom is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. This is a proverb which concludes this section of Scripture. What Jesus is saying is that those religious leaders who catch on will be guided by God's wisdom and see Jesus and John as part of God's plan to follow. Jesus Stories comes to you through the sponsorship of Narration by George. Dot com. Each episode features an interesting audiobook for your listening consideration. This episode features an unusual science fiction story from multiple authors and compiled by author Andrea J. Graham. Avatars of Web Surfer tells the story of an artificial intelligence in the 22nd century which is seeking its independence. But he runs most of the world's computers. What will independence mean? <laughs> Check out the book, Avatars of Web Surfer, to find the answer. You'll find it at narrationbygeorge.com slash books, or click the link in the show notes for more information. That's narrationbygeorge.com slash books.
the scene shifts to a dinner party. Jesus has been invited to a dinner by a Pharisee. That's ironic, after Jesus' scolding of them just now. Well, Jesus accepted this invitation. Notice he's accepted invitations for people on the other end of the spectrum as well. He ate with Matthew, the former tax collector, in an earlier episode. Now he's eating with a Pharisee. We learned that there was an uninvited guest at this party. Now, in this day and time, a dinner party like this may have been in an open area so that anyone could come and be in the room with the people of stature. This time, the uninvited guest is a woman who was considered immoral. She may have been a prostitute. She kneels behind Jesus' feet, crying. Let me explain that scene. In this day and time, people did not sit at a table to eat. They would recline or lie next to a low table, propped up on one arm with their feet pointing away from the table. So this woman kneels behind Jesus' feet, crying. As the tears fall on his feet, she wipes them off with her hair. She kisses his feet and then pours a jar of expensive perfume on them. The Pharisee sees this and thinks to himself, if this guy is really a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. Jesus, reading his thought, addresses the Pharisee, and we learn that the Pharisee's name is Simon. Simon, he says, suppose a man loaned some money to two people. To one guy, he gave a loan of two years' wages. To the other, he gave a loan of two months' wages. When it came time to pay, neither man could pay their loans back, so the loaner forgave the debts of each man. So, Simon, which man would love the loaner of the money more? Simon rightly replies, the one whose debt was larger. Yep, says Jesus, and he turns to the woman, but he speaks to Simon. Look at this woman, he says. I came to your house. You didn't offer to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't kiss me as I arrived, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't do me the courtesy of providing olive oil for my head, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Everything that Jesus told Simon that he didn't offer was a courtesy offered to special guests coming into someone's house. Simon didn't offer even the basic courtesies to his guest, Jesus. But this woman, who is considered immoral, has done all of these things and even offered the courtesies afforded to special guests upon entrance into a home. Jesus continues talking with Simon. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Jesus acknowledges the woman's sins, but then he proceeds by speaking to her, Your sins are forgiven. For the Pharisees, this is a scandalous statement, not because it was made to this woman or because of the suspected nature of her sin. It is because that they knew only God can forgive sin. So they say, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? Jesus continues speaking to the woman. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Her faith has led to this woman's actions. Her faith caused her to bestow extravagant honor on Jesus by washing and anointing his feet with perfume something which Jesus' host would not do. Her faith has caused her sins to be forgiven and saved her. So Jesus has pointed out the faith of two very different people in today's Jesus story, a centurion at the first and now a prostitute. Neither of these people would be expected to be people of faith in the Jewish culture in which Jesus lived. But Jesus pointed out that the centurion's faith was greater than any he had seen so far, and the faith of the prostitute was great enough to save her. Save her from what? When Jesus speaks of salvation, he is speaking of being assured of an eternal home with Jehovah God. That's our time for this episode of Jesus Stories. Next time we find out who supports Jesus' ministry, 
financially. It might surprise you. Jesus will deal with some misconceptions about the origin of his power, and Jesus will have dinner with another Pharisee. That's all on the next Jesus Story episode. Jesus Stories are available on your favorite podcast player. That includes Apple, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Pandora, Spotify, Overcast, and even more than that. Invite your friends and neighbors to check us out, and then leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts to help others to find us. Don't forget, this podcast audio is also available on YouTube. Just follow the link at the website, jesusstories.info. So have you ever wanted to share this podcast with others? Of course, sharing on social media is easy. Our links are in the website. But what about when you're on a one-on-one conversation with someone, a friend, or maybe even just an acquaintance? Let me share with you what I do. I carry a business card with Jesus Stories information on it, inviting my contact to listen to the podcast. I will ask If they listen to podcasts, most people, not everyone, but most people will say, yeah, I do. I will then ask them to check out the Jesus Story podcast by handing them one of the business cards. You can do the same. I put a template for this business card on my website. Just go to jesusstories.info and click on the sharing this podcast tab for a downloadable template. Use that template to print up your own business card. Don't forget, we're on social media, on Facebook and Instagram. Look for Jesus Stories, the podcast. On Twitter, look for Jesus Stories Pod, or click on the links on our website, jesusstories.info. That's jesusstories.info. And I invite you to join me in two weeks for the next Jesus Stories episode. We'll see you then.